Uh, welcome everybody to Emporia. I'm just going to give an introduction to who we are, how we got here, and why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, I think, you know, it's interesting, Dan and my presentation are about as far apart as you can get, but a lot of messages and a lot of thinking is the same. I'm going to talk a lot more about failures and complications than I am about successes <laughs> and things like that. It's just part of what we are doing. Um, I, I think it's important that our customers understand that because from my generation on down, we have grown up in Disneyland. And people come to my farm and they want to see Disneyland. They think they're going to see this pristine meadow with butterflies flitting over daisies and wolves and cows having a birthday party for the rabbit. That's not what happens at my farm. We have musk thistle, bindweed, pigweed, anything ugly imaginable, and last night was no exception. Three inches of rain on the north end of the farm, two are on the south end, two thirty on the north end, 13 dead chickens, one lamb in the fence, four fences washed out, both cow herds were on the loose. <laughs> Missing anything, what happened? It's not Sunday, and then you're here. And we're here. So that, that was our morning, that, those are the numbers for this morning. So it's not always Disneyland people, and that's just, it happens. So, uh, and with the weather we have and the climate we have going on right now, these extremes are becoming more and more. Uh, in our area, the drought started on June 22, 2010. In the last five years, we've been going five to eight months without rain, and then we get a third to half of our average annual rainfall in six to eight weeks. And we're now at the end of our, our last rain spell. We could do another, we could be into the first part of next year before we get a rain again. Our whole motto is farming in nature's image. And uh, we know how to pope on our side. It doesn't get much higher up than that. Uh, how I got here, I'm, I'm not old enough to be a, a hippie, but I'm old enough that I grew up on the back end of that era of the environmental movement of the late 60s and early 70s. And one of the first influences in my life was watching the Cuyahoga River burning in Ohio. You see, I, the people my age are shaking their heads. I grew up on a river. I had no understanding at the age of 10 how the hell a river could ever catch on fire. So those are some of the things that got me started in my thinking. Even though I got swayed into conventional farming in the early years, I always knew in the back of my mind that there was a better way. So that, that's kind of got me started where we are today. The big mover for me, uh, conventional till in the early years from the late 70s through the early 90s. Then no-till, we converted to 100% no-till in 1995. Unfortunately, once we converted to no-till, we kept our rotation simple, corn soybean. Not enough carbon in the system, not enough cover on the soil. In my career, from 1979 to 2003, we lost 145,000 ton of topsoil estimated off of our farm. I am not that bad of a farmer. My neighbors would have to give you similar stories. This is not an unusual event. About five and a half ton of <coughs> soil per acre in conventional till in Kansas is lost to erosion, wind or, or water, east to west Kansas. Organic, conventional, it doesn't matter. If you're doing tillage, these are the numbers you're going to be dealing with. $2.9 million worth of topsoil off of my farm. Uh, I cannot pass that burden to my kids. So we have, we have made a complete change from 2003. Our whole emphasis on our operation is about the soil first. Chickens, corn, wheat, pigs, it doesn't matter. Every decision comes down to how is this going to affect the soil today, tomorrow, next week, next year, in 50 years, before we make any kind of decisions. When you farm with an emphasis on the soil, what is soil organic matter worth? And if you look at this picture, this entire field was planted to this mix of cover crop right here. This is in 2012. I think everybody here understands what 2012 was in Kansas. Worst year since 1936. Any ideas why I only have a crop right there? We had put out a bale of hay here for the cows two winters prior. So organic matter was through the roof in this area. Actually, when we planted this cover, we had residue on the entire field except for the circle. So we had absolutely no moisture in that circle. That's what we can do when we get our soils back to the levels they were a couple hundred years ago before we degraded them with tillage and erosion and, and poor farming practices. We need to have an emphasis on carbon. It is the foundation of life, above and below ground. So we started looking into cover cropping. We, we, I played with cover cropping in the late 90s. We went away from it in the early 2000s and the droughts. Came back to it in 2003. This is a test plot that we planted in 2010. This is Lynette standing out 
this is some barley. It was fall planted, monoculture barley. Jump over 10 feet. This is the same barley planted in a, a three or four way mix. You notice where the barley is, ankle high on the net. No fertilizer, no chemicals, nothing in here. No fertilizer, no chemicals, 10 feet over. Barley is almost twice as tall, can somebody tell me why? Synergisms of planting multiple plants together. In the native prairie or in the native forest, you don't find just oak trees or just big blue stem. You find all these plants, grasses, legumes, broadleaves, all growing together in synergisms. There's a lot of stuff going on below ground that most soil scientists have no clue. The sharpest ones on the planet were just starting to figure out all these microbes and, and their relationships with each other and how they help to feed the plants. You cannot have any synergisms going on in a soil like this that's been heavily tilled. Organic, conventional, I don't care. If you're doing this to your soil, you're killing it. Crab spider, earthworms, microbes, all thriving under a no-till system with high carbon management, lots of covers, lots of residue, a living root 24-7. Once you stop the tillage, the earthworms and you keep a living root there to feed the earthworms, the earthworms return. 25 earthworms per, per cubic foot, which we've measured multiple times on our farm, equals 30,000 ton of manure per acre. How you guys can grow a sweet corn crop or a cash grain corn crop on 30 ton of manure? That's without cows or any other inputs. We now use cover crops and then we plant our cash crops into them. Our early cover crops for monocultures, this would be a a cereal cover crop. This was sprayed out. Today we could use a crop roller to roll this down, plant our corn into. Um, you can see we're pretty late season. One small weed has finally poked its way through the residue. So not only are we building soil organic matter, we've got residue there helping us with weed control also early and late season. Monocultures uh, I think are a thing of the past, I hope, whether you're on a garden or on a large scale farm or something in between. Uh, we have no place for monocultures. Mother Nature doesn't allow it. She doesn't like it. And that's why we have weeds. So we want polycultures. This is a grain corn crop grown in about a, I don't, can't remember, it's about a 10 or 15 way mix of cover crops. The cover crops are designed to be low growing, non-competitive, you know, so that they're not up interfering with the corn, helping keep the ground shaded and causing some of those synergisms that we see. Um, actually, what we're wanting this to be is living weed control living fertility. We grow all kinds of things, cover crops, radishes, brassicas are some of our favorites. They're great for scavenging nutrients. It's hard to see, but there's a tap right here that we broke off down in here somewhere. If you've got excess nitrogen or things like that in your system, this radish or a turnip will do the same thing, rape, all those things. We'll suck that stuff back up it's, that if we don't capture it, it's going to leak into the water system and become a burden to the cities and it's money out of our pockets. But this is going to get back up into the tuber, and when, once this radish or turnip dies, it's going to break down, it's going to make that, those nutrients available for next year's grain crop. This is my favorite quote of all time, modern research divides nature into tiny pieces and conducts tests that conform neither with natural law nor with practical experience. The results are arranged for convenience of research, not according to the needs of the farmer. I, sh I show this for a couple different reasons. First of all, I love research and education. I like to read things and I like to learn things. Take that all with a grain of salt. Just because a researcher has done this, and especially as we started getting into more polycultures and start dealing with nature, that corn crop that I showed you with all those things growing in there, how do you measure that? And then when you have three inches of rain, or seven inches of rain in July this year in one week, next year in July you get no rain, <laughs> It's extremely hard, the more, the more variables you put into these operations, it's extremely hard for science to measure them. The other thing is, when a farmer or when a researcher looks at this field of soybeans, what do they see as the problem? Whether this is soybeans or carrots, I don't care. What's the problem here, guys? Weeds. Weeds. When Mother Nature looks at this field, what does she see as the problem? Bare soil. Bare soil. I talked about weeds a little bit ago. Mother Nature hates bare soil and she will not allow it. Weeds are just her first responders. They're the fastest thing she can get to grow. And the more we attack the weeds, whether it's with tillage or with chemicals, the more she's going to fight back. And in my world, coming out of the conventional ag world, we have proof of that with Roundup resistant weeds. And so we've come out with a new technology and we already have resistance to it and it hasn't even hit the market yet.
Mother Nature will find a way around anything we throw at her, whether it's t chemicals or tillage or whatever the technology is, because she's going to defend her planet at all costs. So what we're doing with our cover crops, especially growing with our, with our cash crops, we're taking something that we can't control and trying to plant something in there that we can control so we actually have weeds living with that cash crop. It's something that we have more control of. Another photo from 2012, and I talked about failures and things like that, and this is a failure gone right. We had a winter barley crop. We harvested for grain, made 75 bushel of the acre. Barley is a great winter crop. It beat the drought that year. It was ready to harvest for the drought hit. We had a phenomenal crop off of it. We double cropped soybeans into it. This is in 2012. By the time the soybeans emerged, we were in complete burn up. We didn't spray out the volunteer barley. Uh, we let it go because it was already 100 degrees, no sense wasting any more money. Came back in the fall, and while everybody else in the county had zero soybeans to harvest, we had a 17 bushel double crop soybean crop with all that barley growing with it all summer long with no rain and 40 some consecutive days above 100. So again, if somebody can explain to me how that happened, yeah. As again, there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the soil that we have no clue what's, what's going on. A lot of synergisms. But this is closer to imitating what's going on in the prairies because there's multiple things growing out here. I know there's only two, it's not enough, but we have a grass and a broadleaf. Part of it is uh, keeping the soil temperature cool. Once you let the soil temperature get very warm, you start killing off your microbial life. Where we have a living cover crop on there, that helps keep the soil temperature down. This is just a little bit of some of the things that we've played with the last few years. Grasses, broadleaves, legumes, annuals, perennials, vegetables, all used in our cover crops. Part of our system is it, we focus on insects and not just the good insects or the bad insects. There's no such thing as good and bad insects. There's just insects. We need them all to keep the system healthy and active. Talked about the crop roller a little bit. I bought this with my neighbor. We're struggling. This is succeeding some. We're having a lot of failures with it. but. There are places we can use this and replace chemicals in our operation. This is my neighbor's daughter. She's running the crop roller for him this year. His kids are 10 years younger than mine. My kids never learned how to till. They, they have no clue how to pull a plow. Thank God. How cool would it be if, if Kevin's kids can never learn how to spray? Pasture cropping is another thing we're working with. Um, and we're going to get to see a little bit of this when we get to the farm. Um, this was a cool season perennial pasture that we purposely overgrazed to send it into dormancy early. Then we plant a warm season cover crop into the pasture. This is what it looked like last year. Uh, Mother Nature kind of threw us a curveball last year. It didn't look very good early on, but in the winter, we had a lot of high quality forage for livestock grazing. And the, perennial, the cool season perennial pasture come back this year and it was much better than it had been in a long time. So my question for you is what will you leave to the next generation? If these are your two kids, and you're wondering which one's going to come to the farm. First of all, in my world, one of them has to find another job because there's not enough acres. But we're, what we're doing today with stacking enterprises, we now can let both kids come home. But then the question becomes, will they be able to? Because the kid in the red cap is going to have cancer. 50-50 chance the kid in the blue cap, a very good chance will be autistic. The health in America is declining very rapidly. We lead the whole planet in all communicable diseases. And I totally believe that much of it is tied to what we've done to our soil and the nutrient density of the food that we're removing from our soil today and how poor it is. And it brings the question, where does your food come from? The photo on the right is a high production hen house. Could be organic, could be conventional. On the left is ours. Knowing who your farmer is, knowing how he's growing it, who cares what kind of label he's got on it, but there's questions you need to ask your farmer where your food is coming from. And if you can live with those, fine. If you can't, find a new farmer. We now have grass-fed beef. Um, this is what it looked like when we started doing our rotational grazing. This is how we were grazing our grass. Today, this is what we want our grass looking like when we're grazing it. Uh, Lynette brought in chickens. She started with some laying hens. She then added the meat birds. Next thing she brought on the operation of sheep. So not only do we not have diversity in our cropping and in our cover cropping, we want diversity in the livestock as well. She's added a few turkeys and some ducks and guineas and about anything else. Pigs will be the next one. We, we have some pigs now, but we're really going to expand that operation. Honeybees, she brought in last year. These have been an absolute blast. And I'll tell you, once you start growing honeybees, it makes you much less wanting to spray insecticides on anything that you have.
So plus plus there. We graze year round. We like to put out hay. Once you start doing mob grazing or rotational grazing, one of the benefits is your livestock become much more used to human activity, less stress, higher marbling in the meat. There's, there's science to back that up. So we can now get pictures like this out of our babies or our adults. We switch to, uh, are in the process of switching to British white cattle, which is more of a forage breed. So how fast can we regenerate the souls that we have destroyed over the last hundred years with our tilling practices? Ten years ago, we were told it takes thousands of years to build an inch of topsoil. We have producers all over the planet that have done it in under a decade. We can do this much faster than science told us we could a decade ago. This is a soil pit dug at my place a couple years ago. In 2003, this is what it would have looked like right at the surface. And seven or eight years later, we now have several inches of topsoil, and you can see all the streaking of the new topsoil we're forming down to it. It'll happen very, very fast. So I leave you with this question, what will you leave to the next generation? Until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can walk. <laughs>